ask ourselves are about what are we trying to achieve? What's the purpose of our work? Whether we want to think of it as work or our lives or whatever, what's the purpose of it? What, what, what really does work? And, and, and what must be protected, and what must we really start to challenge. I think really we've been living in a little post-institution professional bubble for, for really for about 30, 40 years, where we just kind of assumed that things were going generally the right direction. You know, it might be the value people program arrives, and that sounds nice. Well, they're spending a bit of money, we'll take some of that money, and we'll have a nice bit of this and a bit of that. You know, and oh, this is a nice idea, self service support, or support of living, or personal centered planning. All these are nice ideas that come along, and it, it all seems to just kind of rain down, and, and off we go. I think we need to get out of that bubble. That isn't really working, and the, the bubble has really been popped by this government. And I don't think any new government is going to reinstitute a new bubble for us, where we can safely just assume gentle and positive progress into the future. We've got to really start examining at a much more fundamental level what's working, what's not working, what we need to change. I mean, for me, one of the... This is Hayley, who I... Uh, I used to be a teaching assistant at a school in America, and she's just like the most beautiful. She sadly died at a very young age of a very complex disability. But the question for me is as simple as this, really. You know, what's wrong with Hayley? Absolutely not. I can tell you about the spine or you know, her health problems or all these things. But what's wrong with Hayley as a unique being in the world? Nothing. She's just another unique human being to be cherished, to be supported. What, what's worth fighting for? What are we trying to do? So two words that I think we should definitely be hanging on to are community and citizenship. I think we need to wake up to these two. And they're, they're kind of yin-yang concepts for me. They're just complementary concepts. You can't have community without citizens. You can't have citizens without community. Citizens do community. Communities are made up of citizens. They're not two separate things. And it's not like I'm the first person to notice this. You can go back two and a half thousand years to Aristotle, and he's talking about how human beings need to be how people have good lives. <clears throat> he says, he who is unable to live in society who has no need because he is sufficient for himself must be a beast or a god. He is no part of a state. And for state there, he really means community. He yes, that we need each other. It's a simple thought, but it's a really important thought. When people start talking about independence or needing to be independent or not needing other people as if these are good things, these are bad things. These aren't good things. Our need for each other is critical to our essential humanity. Otherwise, we are a beast or a god, and we're not. And part of what that mutual dependence is about is valuing our diversity. It's valuing Haley <coughs> who Haley is, including, not excluding, her needs. <coughs> our needs are part of what makes us human. And one, one of the things I think socially we've struggled with for a good couple of hundred years, and I think it has been a particular crisis of the modern age, is how to reconcile what we do feel at some level we need, which is to be equals, but also to recognise that we're all different, and we want to be different. We want to be the same as everybody else. It doesn't make any sense, does it? And again, Aristotle, this might again seem one of the slightly funny quotes, but Aristotle says, you know, a community is not made out of equals, but on the contrary of people who are different and unequal, the community comes into being through equalising. That might seem weird. It's not that the com it, Aristotle would say the community <coughs> homogenises us, makes us all the same. That's not what equalising means. It means the community is the place where we learn to treat each other as equals, as if we were equal. The key here is to work out how to reconcile our fundamental equality as human beings, the fact that every single one of us is worth the same, and the fact that every single one of us is diverse and unique individual. And the way in which they're reconciled, according to Aristotle, is through coming together in community. And, the, and the, it's through being a citizen. 
So citizenship is for me a um, really useful, long-standing, if slightly weird word. We're a bit uncomfortable with it in the United Kingdom. We kind of associate it with the French chopping each other's heads off, or you know, Stalin or Lenin, and or very unattractive characters from Russian history. Or you know, we we we're, we we don't have good associations in this country with the word citizenship, and also it's associated with being against the Queen. Paradoxically enough, I'm not even against the Queen. I just think even we can have the Queen and be citizens myself. Some people don't agree. Because um, I think the kind of citizenship we're talking about is kind of everyday citizenship. Being able to treat each other as equals, respect each other as equals, and respect the differences that each brings to each other. And societies do that by recognising rights that people have, but also by placing duties on one another, and also creating freedom, spaces where people can just, as it were, be themselves. So the whole history of political theory for 3,000 years or more has been the attempt to figure out what the kind of right kind of balance between these three movements <coughs> are. But I suppose I'm putting it to you that the history of people with disabilities is very much telling us that this notion of having to reconcile equality and diversity is critical to becoming the kind of place that surely we want to be. Hayley knows or knew as clear as day that she's never going to be competing as an equal in on the racetrack. I remember that I pushed her down the racetrack. Yes, I mean it's it's different. She's different, but she's just as valuable a member of the community, even though she can't run down the racetrack. So for me, that's suppose that's my pro that's my basic proposition to you is that we start thinking about notion of citizenship much more seriously. And this is, uh, and I said this to the group this morning, for me citizenship is an attempt to get to the heart of what people were trying to talk about when people talk about normalisation or social revitalisation. But the attractiveness for me of citizenship, even though it's a slightly weird word, is that it's something we should all think about. This isn't a special status for disabled people. Oh, how can we make disabled people citizens, as if we already are them? I know many people with learning difficulties who are much better citizens than people with the BMWs who, who, who drive to work, come back and sit in front of the telly all evening. I mean, citizenship is about relationships, citizenship is about your commitment to one another, about your contribution back into the community. There are plenty of people with disabilities living strong lives of citizenship. So this isn't actually about kind of paternalistic let's make them citizens. It's about actually us figuring out how to be citizens together. And for professionals and services and people and local government folk, then that's asking some very different questions about what it is that you're bringing to the party. Not nothing. That is, I'm not starting with this kind of, like, it would be better if you didn't play a role vision. That's nonsense. People do need extra resources from time to time in their lives in the form of money. There are genuine skills that need to be transmitted around um, supporting people well. Uh, there are th people need people who can watch out for them occasionally. There are all sorts of things we need to get right in our communities to support each other effectively. So for me, this you know, being a citizen is much, much better, much more interesting, much more exciting than being normal. It's about being the unique, free individual that we can be. And it's about going on that fine, getting through those final barriers to the other side of it. What's wrong with the institution? That's kind of an interesting question to ask. I think when, when I started working uh, in this area in 1990, the, you know, a lot of people, if you said what was wrong with the institution, the kind of immediate response was, well, it was, it was big, or it was in the country, or it had walls, or maybe it segregated people. But I don't think it was a very subtle understanding of the problem. I mean, all of those things are somewhat problematic. Being the country is a problematic. I don't think I'd quite like to live in the country so. so I can't, that can't be the problem. What we rather miss in the story about the institution is the way in which largely it's about power. Institutions are power structures. And it's the power structure that's really damaging to people. And if you think about citizenship in this way, if you think about uh, the kind of what I think of as like the seven keys to, to citizenship, you can also start to see why institutions are toxic to citizenship. 
And what an institution does is it basically defines the purpose of your life. Effectively, it nullifies the purpose of your life. Or it says your purpose is to be, you know, a high grade or on ward B or whatever. You don't define yourself. Your sense of purpose is missing. You, it, the institution strips people of control and freedom in their lives. People cannot control the big things, but they can't even control the small things. They're left with minute degrees of control over their own lives. In the institution, you are effectively automatically poor. Even if you had a million pounds, you'd be poor, because you've got nowhere to spend it, nothing to spend it on. You can't do anything. You're just, your poverty is built into the DNA of the institution. It does give you shelter, there's no doubt about it. Gives you shelter, that's a certainly one thing it gives you, but it makes you homeless. It strips you of a place where you belong, where you define what goes on, where you have privacy, where you define who comes in the door. You don't have a home. Institutions provide care for sure. But let's not forget that I think that sometimes the people coming in and working as institutions sometimes still manage to bring with them humanity and do some good things. I mean, when you listen properly to what people say about their experience in the institutions, I don't hear people wanting to go back. But they weren't saying all those people were horrible or nasty. They can find good stories and good experiences from some people. But what they tend to find was all of it was careless care. Care that couldn't support them in community. You can take care of a pot plant. A pot plant doesn't have to do anything. You can't help a pot plant, you can't assist a pot plant, you can't support a pot plant. You can care for a pot plant. Now, we need to be really care careful about words like care, I think. People think that the word care is connected sometimes to the word charity, uh, and the word which also has this, another meaning in the word love. But it isn't. It's connected to the, an, an ancient Norse, Anglo-Saxon word, which is the same word that gives root to, well, in Scottish, to care to mourn for. That's where the word care comes from, actually. It's, it's to mourn for the not yet dead. Now, I'm not saying that's what people always mean when they use the word, but I think, I, don't, I mean, you know, I know, I know many family members who are quite happy with the word carer, but I, I think family is a much better word than care of itself. I don't really like the word care. You're there because you're family. Caring is an activity that you're using that language because the system uses that language, I think. Institutions disconnect people even when they push people together, which is, if you've ever been on the London tube train, you find the same phenomenon there. Or you push people together into the same space and you disconnect them you come. And institutions are deeply barren places. Lennox Castle Hospital, which is the institution I help people get out of in, in the late 90s, um, it was explained to me that the, the, the camp was built on two sites, that up the hill and down the hill, and the top of the hill were the men, the bottom of the hill were the women, and there was a little guard house in the middle, which one time when I was there was turned into a kind of art crafts room, but it was actually an art, uh, a guard house, and if you crossed the line, a man went down the hill, a woman went up the hill, a whistle was blown, and a little team of people, because the central purpose of the institution was to stop people breeding, their language, breeding. So this is our inheritance, folks, this is, and this is the institution, and this is what, what we're struggling to escape from, and not really successful at. I think it, I, I do, I, I kind of think the word safety is, um, gets a bit of a bad press, so I kind of like, I'm trying to reintroduce, re, reintroduce the word safety like it's a good thing, because like often the word safety is used as, a, as an excuse for uh, controlling people, but actually, um, it's not a very good, control is a very good way of making people less safe. <coughs> uh, you know, control is something you need to be very careful with. Citizenship is the way you keep safe. You know, having a life of meaning and value makes you safer. It makes the other people around you treat you differently and think of you with more respect because your life has distinct meaning. It's one of the ways we avoid people being stigmatised. If you have freedom, you can say no, and it means something, so you can stop bad things happening to you. If you have money, enough money, you can go and buy something else, you can do something else, you can follow your plans through. 
You don't necessarily, actually, interestingly, too much money is bad for citizenship, I've discovered. And Plato had the view that the richest person in the community should only be four times richer than the poorest person in the community. We're a long, 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 long way from that. But a reasonable degree of money is an important aspect of citizenship because it gives you enough independence to say, well, I'm going to do this my way, I'm going to take these set of risks, I'm going to try and do things, follow my life projects through, set up a business, have a job that I like. A home, citizens have homes, and home, having a home is a safe thing. You can, you can close the door. Um, interestingly, you know, and, and we shouldn't be careless about this, um, action on elder abuse in a, uh, a report a few years ago which said more people get abused in their own home than in residential care. They were right, but what was rather strange was that they hadn't done the basic maths of working out the numbers of relative numbers of people in their own homes in residential care. And when you did the basic bit of maths it turns out that being in residential care was ten times more dangerous than being in your own home. You know, a, a little bit of extra maths sometimes might be so good anyway, I don't know. Um, it's, it's really important to control who helps you and have the right kind of support and support that connects you to other people, not support that makes you kind of isolated and dependent. Um, and it's really important that people get stuck into community life, that they work. They work for money or they work out of love in the, all the kind of important work that's done by mums and family members and all sorts of other people, uh, or they work in their community and contribute, because that's where all the good stuff happens in that kind of, those acts of work that we do. And we need to be working, contributing. Um, and it's really, really, really unsafe to have nobody love you. The people who really get hurt and abused are the people who don't have love in them. If you've got love in your life and that love, the flame of that stays alive, then you've got a good shot. You've got a good shot, however difficult the surroundings. But when that dies, you're in deep trouble. And as far as I can work out, and what certainly I've argued in writing over the last 10 years or so, is that I can't see any fundamental obstacle to citizenship for people with disabilities, no matter how severe the disability, no matter how complex, no matter how... Uh, challenging the communication problems are. All of those things are soluble problems. Uh, they're not reasons to exclude people from citizenship.